Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to another SSI India Masterclass webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about coral and fish identification. And this is one that we're really looking forward to. Uh, before we start, and while we wait for the last few people to join in, uh, I'm going to take you through some of the basic webinar guidelines. All of you that are attending will be in listen and view mode only, which means that uh, you will remain muted throughout the session. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat window and one of us on the panel will try our best to help you out. Um, for questions relating to the subject being discussed, please use the question and answer or Q&A window. Uh, as this is uh, as this way everyone else can see your question as well you can take a look uh, before posting if someone else has already posted a similar question and in this case you can just click the like button to upvote it and this will give it more priority and it will get answered first um, finally there will be a, a feedback link shared at the end of the webinar so before you go please take the time to let us know what you thought of uh, today's session um, so, SSI India started with the Science of Diving program, which sp uh, spanned five webinars in five weeks, and we have now moved on to ecology. We've covered sharks, mantas, and rays, as, as well as marine ecology in the past couple of weeks. And next Saturday, we have sea turtle ecology. We will be moving on to conservation and sustainability as well in the weeks to come. So stay tuned to our regular updates. One important thing I would like to communicate is that these webinars are based on topics that are offered as SSI ecology specialty courses. So if you are interested in getting certified for any of these subjects, please get in touch with us for more details and we'll be happy to sign you up. Um, collecting these certifications will count towards rating yourself uh, as an SSI advanced open water diver, as well as an SSI master diver. Um, for today's coral and fish identification, uh, masterclass webinar, we have with us Vardhan and Prerna, who will talk about their respective areas of expertise. Vardhan Patankar was introduced to diving at a very young age, and because he lived by the sea, was extremely curious about the various interactions that he saw in his environment. Vardhan actually wanted to become a commercial diver, but luckily for the world of conservation, he realized that commercial diving isn't a very glamorous lifestyle. And his love for the outdoors and especially the underwater world became the deciding factor for why he chose marine biology as his career. He has spent close to two decades doing research work on corals and in his journey, he has traveled extensively all across the coast of India. Prerna Gauda, a fish specialist for today, uh, remembers her father telling her older siblings how science was the way forward and how it was the answer to all our questions and the starting point for new discoveries and knowledge. Prerna did her master's in marine ecology and then became a dive master. It was during her time as a dive professional that she realized her true calling was in the field and she went back to college to do her second master's degree in marine biology and ecology at the James Cook University in Australia. She moved back to India to start actively working in the field and now spends most of her time underwater doing what she loves the most, counting fish. So big thanks to Vardhan and Prerna for agreeing to do this. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you guys now. Good evening, everyone. A big thank you to Rahul, uh, Siddharth, Mariam, Mahima for being persistent and to SSI for organizing this event. I hope that at the end of the session, uh, you will be able to learn a bit more about corals and fish that we all love dearly. I'd like to begin this talk by showing you a picture that I took in the year 2006 at Cabra Island in the Nicobas. What you see in the picture is spectacular reefs, loads of fish and invertebrates. And if you were to dive in a place which looks similar, you would be delighted. But if your job was to identify these corals and fish, perhaps you would be scratching your head. And that's what I did when I dove back there in 2006. And uh, perhaps that's what I've been doing ever since as I'm trying to understand complexity of the reefs. Uh, in particular, I, along with my team, am surveying the reefs using global reef resilience protocol. So in nutshell, we go underwater with uh, install many times on small dungies with portable compressor tanks and uh, go island hopping and try to explore the reefs. Uh, and when you think of when I talk about reef resilience protocol, 
uh, reef resilience is a complex uh, subject and it has many dimensions and meaning it has it, you, some sometimes it is interpreted as coping adapting such sustainability but what i mean by resilience is essentially an ability of a system to bounce back after any catastrophes and the system i'm talking here is the coral reefs and this is what i'm trying to understand so i'm trying to understand reef resilience uh, uh, and reef resilience uh, and uh, when i go underwater uh, we essentially we do uh, transects which is essentially we lay a tape and we count all the fish that are found in the vicinity we also count all the uh, benthic substrate categories which is whatever is on benthos which is the bottom and we try to identify all the corals all the invertebrates uh, all the coral recruits and so on and we all together we measure more than uh, uh, 18 to 20 factors on every per dive and then post hoc we enter this data and try to do some multivariate analysis to find out uh, what factors make these certain reefs resilient so we, what you see in this picture particularly there are these this uh, the picture on your left Uh, there are bleach coral uh, what you see in the right it's so perhaps a mix of there are big plate corals and if you see here it is com completely covered with algae what i'm we are trying to understand as a team we are trying to understand what factors make certain reef resilient because if you are a manager and if you are putting all your efforts in protecting reef which is already doomed perhaps your efforts are not useful uh with uh, and this these surveys my most of my work has been based in andaman nicobar islands which is located along the east coast uh, but i have also dived extensively in lakshadweep as i was helping my supervisor rohan athar in his surveys i have also carried out some underwater studies in gulf of manar and gulf of kutch in addition i have led the reef resilience surveys in grand netrani along uh, the west coast of india with generous support from wwf in 2020 i was lucky enough to lead the expedition to angria bank uh, siddharth was very helpful in procuring equipments and uh, which is uh, angria bank is a submerged bank located approximately 130 kilometers from vijayadurg uh, this was joint expedition between cwcs and cmlr and with this bit of background of what i am doing i'll get jump into basics of coral reefs and uh, as this class is about coral reef identification uh, if you look at co any coral reef uh, or any corals uh, there are certain how if you think of how reefs are made it has certain checklists which is are important such as it needs uh, warm water it requires low nutrients it requires depth it the depth should be uh, perhaps under 100 meters and it should be shallow waters and only when and particular wave conditions and only then corals thrive and that's why corals uh, are found only in warm waters and across the indo pacific the best coral reefs are of course in new caledonia caledonia Uh, uh and uh in southeast asia in core which is called coral triangle and caribbean and atlantic but this is mainly found across in this uh, tropical belt and a bit about how in terms of the structure of corals and how reef began forming the reef can began with a single coral polyp uh, which anchors itself into a rock for protection a coral builds a limestone exoskeleton by combining calcium and carbonate uh, which are abundant in shallow water and what you see is a limestone and that's the entire structure of the reef and with this because polyps share an exoskeleton the limestone uh, the limestone grows and forms remarkable shapes and what you see in these pictures are some of the shapes that a friend has illustrated generously and what you see here and uh, more than this because of this uh when this limestone structure which is essentially calcium carbonate structure when it dies it accumulates and forms an expansive reef uh, on which life flourishes that you see in uh, our waters and uh, as colony expands it becomes a fringing reef uh, which you see uh, so and as per darwin's uh, who hypothesized that reef form uh, because of volcanic eruptions and then as uh, volcano volcano Uh, subsided and what you see which is very close to the islands is fringing reefs and reefs which are closer to the coastline such as andamans whereas uh, if as the island goes further subsides the area the sea level rises it becomes a barrier reef 
uh, and uh, then there is a third kind of reef which is atoll systems uh, where and a prerna who is my colleague uh, and coast speaker she will be talking about atoll system uh, in detail so i'll hand over to prerna from this uh, and who will be talking about reef fish yes thanks vardhan that's some really interesting work and a lot of work that you've done um so hi everyone my name is prerna and i will be talking about coral reef fishes and lots of other things but first uh, i'm going to give a glimpse of what i do so as uh, so from vardhan's work which is mostly in the bay of bengal let's dive straight across to the western side of india in the arabian sea to the lakshadweep islands as most of you would know um, lakshadweep islands basically are a group of islands peeking out of from the arabian sea uh, what's interesting is that these islands are actually made of corals so basically um, lakshadweep are volcanic mountains that submerged millions of years ago and uh, coral reefs formed around them and sometimes coral reefs formed around a shallow area of water which you see right here this aqua blue colored areas so these are called lagoons and so these lagoons are important areas for a number of fish in lakshadweep and out of them there's a group of really small sized fishes which are collectively called bait fish and these are the fish i study so along with the cool, uh, uh, along with a group of really cool people i basically uh, collect different types of scientific information like how many of these fishes are there what are their preferred surroundings and their biology so but you guys must be wondering that why why do we have to study these tiny fishes well um so the entire coral reef system is uh shaped by a number of complex interactions between different organisms and uh one important part of this complex is us humans so because we depend on these marine systems for food and for livelihood so the bait fish that i'm studying are important for the people of lakshadweep especially the fishers of lakshadweep uh so the especially the polen line tuna fishers of lakshadweep so you have the traditional polen line tuna fishing which happens in lakshadweep where these bait fish are used as lures to catch tuna so this is basically what i do now but as uh, it was mentioned earlier that i used to work in the andamans before and that's when i got to see firsthand how sensitive and how beautiful coral uh so i think i would like to really learn more about that from vardhan so vardhan thank you prerna you've been doing wonderful work and like like to learn more about your work as well um so as prerna spoke about a little bit about her work and i spoke about my work we'll move on to actual uh jump into directly into coral id a uh, coral as you must be aware they are animals similar to jellyfish belonging to phylum anthozoa cla and class cnidaria there are two types of corals uh, homotopic corals and or reef building corals and non reef building corals if you want to understand structure of corals and want to learn there are uh, learn their id it's important to know few terms i know these are technical terms and it could be daunting but just bear with me because these are just four five terms so the, uh, as you see uh, there are polyps which are uh, and some corals have eight co polyps some uh, corals such as alveopora there are 12 there are some goniopora there are 24 there are many number of polyps so these are polyp structures and there is septa and there is septa coste which is uh, 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 what you see the structure here uh, and then there is uh, together it's sept called septa coste and if you have this structure if you remember this only four to five terms and if you take pick up any field guide or any coral id guide you should be good to go in terms of identification 
uh, coral is essentially it's a test of relationship. And uh, there is there are algae that live in the coral polyp surface layer. Uh, there is zooxanthellae, which is called which is dinoflagellate algae. And that algae gets nutrient and safe place to live. And um, now corals get oxygen and uh, help with base removal. And that's how this symbiotic relationship exists. And that's how corals have been thriving. Uh, the corals have very complex uh, form of uh, reproductive strategies. And uh, uh, they, they have all kinds of, in fact, reproduction strategies for, from asexual budding to fragmentation. So in asexual, uh, a bud from coral big colony uh, separates and starts growing as independent colony. In uh, fragmentation, of, uh, which is used extensively in coral reef restoration project, uh, a, a branch of a coral breaks off and that branch or a fragment starts growing on its own as a coral colony. And of course, there is sexual reproduction where uh, the uh, where in that there are corals are also known as a broadcast fauna. So in Andamans or uh, the, in Lakshadweep during winter time, uh, corals are known to release eggs and sperm into the water column, which stay alive for around 28 to 48 hours. And they are brooders and they're releasing, where uh, they're also brooders, which are, they release fertilized eggs. And this results in free swimming larvae called planula, which settles to form a new colony. Uh, these are few reproductive strategies that are used, that are that corals use, and uh, people like Veron have extensively studied this. And uh, because uh, of their complex reproductive strategies, which is which is uh, which is everything, they uh, every now and then there are new species that are formed, uh, and that's why coral ID gets very tricky. Uh, and when I talk about zooxanthellae, so what, what I was explaining is this, that uh, inside coral, there is a zooxanthellae and there, when there is any form of stress, it could be uh, pollution, it could be bleed, it could be uh, temperature induced, or it could be anything. What happens is that this healthy colony or the zooxanthellae that uh, lives, the algae that lives inside the coral colony uh, gets expelled out of coral tissue and coral turns white. Similarly, if there is a tsunami, there is storm, there is surges, the physic, there is a physical damage to the coral colony. And even then the colony breaks and what you see is a healthy colony turning into coral rubble. And uh, they, we, in uh, India, they are, especially in the islands, the uh, islands have seen, seen series of bleaching events. Uh, the first documented bleaching event was, uh, or rather major uh, event, bleaching event was in the year 1998. And since then, there have been series of bleaching events. There was bleaching event in 2010, 2012, 2016, which has had adverse impact on the reefs. And as the total cover of the reef has, re uh, and as a result, the total cover has reduced from around 80 to 70 percent, which is how it, it used to be. Now it is uh, around 20 to 30 percent. In addition, uh, climate change is uh, exuberating bleaching and other catastrophic events such as storm surges and cyclone and that is also having an adverse impact on the reef. Uh, so before we jump into coral ID, let me explain broad uh, categories or broad uh, life history categories of different coral, the different corals. So broadly there are, if you go uh, in Indo-Pacific or especially in Southeast Asia or Coral Triangle, you find corals which are Acropora, which are, which is a, one of the most dominant uh, coral genus, uh, or what you call as tagon coral, uh, which is formed, which uh, comes in different shapes. What what you see here is uh, br is branching, digitate, tabular, encrusting, submassive. These are few forms or the shapes of acropora. And then there are non-acroporids. So uh, as biologists, we uh, divide corals into acroporids and non-acroporids. And even there are three volumes, which I'll get to it later, which we use to identify corals. There are uh, there is one whole volume on Acropora and the other two volumes are on all non-Acroporids. And of course, then there are other corals, which are fire corals, uh, your, all your zoanthids, soft corals, organ pipe corals, and so on. So if you, even if you are an enthusiast, even if you are a, a dive professional, and if you don't want to get into details of coral, as long as you can identify the broad life history categories and the, based on their shape, it is uh, enough. So broadly speaking, there are branching corals, which are one, which is one of the most corals of the world, most dominant coral of the world. Then there is uh, the 
characteristic of these uh, acropora how to identify is that they have these axial corallites which is on tip of the coral there will be corallite which is a uh, cup shape uh, structure and there are radial corallites so if you see at the side there will be uh, this uh, corallites that they will be popping in addition uh, 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 this because it's very fragile it, this is a coral you will see across uh, across our waters uh, then uh, there is a plate and uh, uh, foliage which is uh, this massive cabbage kind of looking corals there are many uh, this is a shape i'm talking about there are many coral genera that form this shape such as montipora turbinaria echinophilia and of course of acropora uh, but then there are some some soft coral also that looks exactly like this so one has to be a little careful about when you look at it and the way to go about it is to look at the structure and then there are these submassive coral which later grow into massive such as this uh, these submassive corals again what you should, what you should notice is the corallite structure and the walls uh, and of course then there are a few solitary corals they are known to grow so they are the only corals who are able to move of course to few inches not much but they are able to move otherwise all corals by nature they are sessile which means that they cannot move they once uh, they start reproduce once they attach themselves they cannot move and they grow as a colony but they are there all their life uh and when you dive on to the reef and as yourself and ask yourself fresh question what coral is this which is this is illustration which friend made um the answer is in your head literally because your eyes and brain are the world's most powerful supercomputer and uh, they are able to solve complex uh, visual problems instantly so if you observe closely uh, how a particular coral looks coral id is as easy as diving or perhaps driving a car Uh, so uh, don't get bogged down by these terms i know it was bit technical but then it all depends of where you want to identify what is the level of you wonder you want to identify and as a biologist we use something called keys which is essentially yes and no approach so uh, if you and it all depends on what level you want to identify perhaps as a biologist we identify up to genus or species level but even if you can identify up to a life history category or Uh, shape level uh, or genus level it is fairly good uh so suppose you have you dive in andamans or gulf of manar and you uh, see corals which look something like this or like this which looks very flowery and what you see on, on the right and it doesn't look like coral in uh, coral and then there are these typical shapes and there are these what you see in the, the bottom most picture is it's like a soft coral Uh, so but you when you see this you and you have to give you are given a task to identify the first question that will come to your mind is how the hell to begin and how do how do i go from there what i have been doing and uh, there are some nice guide but this one one of the best what i have been doing using is uh, these three books or uh, which are by veron uh, corals of the world along with coral finder uh, if you have these three volumes and if you have uh, a uh, coral finder then i think you are good to go it has description of 25 families more than 1500 species of sclerectina corals there are almost 12 families 110 genera 618 species that is found in indo pacific the sad thing is the book was law published in 2012 um, uh, and uh, the first volume and uh, since then there have been many changes the good part, so if you have the book what you have is the older version the, but the good thing is they do have very interactive website called www.coralsoftheworld.com if you see that website and there are detailed description of all the corals this coral uh, uh, finder what it does is that it is designed to solve the problem so say you have a coral that doesn't quite fit what you see on your chosen look alike pages then what you see you will see is that it's a crisis but just reverse engineer the problem and try to see it and you will get it because it's very easily explain of how to go about it and what you see in this picture is that uh, here uh, on your uh, top there are these uh, colonies there are corallites there are close ups there are scales and there are characters and it's detailedly mentioned so as a kid we used to play 
uh, matching the cards game. And essentially, if you have played game, played that game, if you have mastered, you should be able to master even coral ID because it's very simple. So imagine you have given a task to identify this coral. So uh, and what you know that based on life form that this coral is uh, it looks like a submassive coral to me. Then you have you you have asked to give uh, look at. The first thing I would do is if you have you again, you like look at coral structure. Now you would see that there are meandering valleys and there are these uh, irregular shaped coralites. There is no cup shaped form, but there are these irregular form. And if you look at closer, you will see the septa and costa, septa as well as costa and wall structure. And based on the characters, if you read the book, what you would get is that you will be able to identify a picture. If you see this uh, 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 this picture. What you the, and if you have coral finder, you based on what you see here, it, it's uh, that this is a symphilia, which is what the coral is, and what you see here is our different genera types. And if you can confirm uh, these characters, then it is uh, you can get pretty much at least two genus levels, pretty much right. Even if you you are just starting off. Uh, so just a tip uh, in terms of how to go about IDing is that. Uh, uh, that it's important to uh, understand and to look at the uh, wall or the structure of the coralite walls. So there are three broad uh, uh, types of uh, coralite structures. One is separate. Uh, then there is common where you will see that the walls are joined and there are indistinct. So, so such as uh, Pavona, uh, they, are, uh, they have indistinct wall. Uh, and uh, just to re summarize, what I have already all mentioned, and uh, to look, show you the detailed clear diagram of corals, these are the structures, which is septa, wall, costae. All your field guide will use these three, four terms, polyps, corallites, and columnar. If you know these, structure, these four, five uh, names, and if you have field guide, you are good to go. But then, even then, there are some corals which are extremely difficult to ID as because they, look, they all look alike. The good part is that coral, uh, that the, uh, the field guide tells you which are the similar looking uh, corals. For example, here there is Favia and uh, Montastia, and there is something called intra and extra tentacular uh, budding. Uh, of course, it is when you see it, it's, it is easier. When you dive, it is uh, easier to see it than to explain. But uh, essentially, when you see this, this is intra. Uh, uh, Intratentacular budding, whereas this is extra tentacular budding. And the coral finder gives uh, a decent, that's a decent job of explaining these kinds of uh, esoteric concepts. Uh, and also, it's a very uh, self explanatory. So, I really, if you are keen, I would urge you to perhaps buy that. Then there is um, uh, there are some corals which are really difficult to identify, such uh, for example, uh, to uh, the Samakura and uh, Cosinaria. And even for experts, it is difficult to tease apart one from the other. But the Coral ID this uh, and the books, it tells you how to go about it. And then there are all uh, these non hermatopic corals, which are, of course, totally different ball game in terms of how to go about identifying. And perhaps that would require a class in itself. And I won't be able to cover because we are talking about Coral ID and fish. What the idea of this uh, uh, talk was to give you guys the tool uh, and then uh, and not to cover all the species, but I'm very happy to give, answer any questions as well as if you have any um, identification related queries or if you want help with identification, I'll be happy to do so. Uh, so to summarize whatever I said, uh, there are different, what is important when you look at any coral is to look at colony shape, which is blanching, plate, column, and crusting. Then it is important to look at the colony structure or the, or, the, or the surface structure of the colony, which is whether it's bumpy, is it smooth, whether it's ridges, whether it has those teeth kind of structures, uh, what, are the, what, are the, what is the structure of the polyps, are they exposed, are they inside? And many times coral ID gets confusing with some corals they are known to, uh, most of them at night, the polyps will be out, but some corals, even during the daytime, the polyps are out. So you cannot see the coralite structure. And if you cannot see the uh, coralite structure, it gets very difficult. Uh, and of course, then there are sh uh, different shapes of coralite, such as round, uh, elliptical, irregular, Y-shaped. 
if you understand that what kind of ridges what kind of valleys are there then it's fairly easy uh, and now of course at the end the last is coral polyps uh, the color is also important though don't go by color because coral is uh, as i uh, mentioned that coral color is mainly due to zooxanthellae and uh, color could be misleading but then polyp color uh, is one way to also know about uh, what coral it is in india uh, we have uh, corals across our coastline uh, we have corals in andaman nicobar which are the most biodiverse uh, followed by lakshadweep um, gulf of manar and gulf of kutch uh, besides uh, recently we dived at angria bank where uh, which is as good as great barrier reef and uh, we found spectacular marine biodiversity in the area including all functional group intact uh, so uh, uh, over to prerna who will now shed some light on fish and their identification thank you thanks vardhan for clarifying so many things about coral identification so guys vardhan just showed how to identify diverse coral forms but how about reef fishes so a larger part of our work is identifying fishes so as i was saying a large part of our work is identifying reef fishes but as ecologists we also try to understand the interactions between different life forms so like what are the interactions between different fishes on a reef so one basic thing that we know for sure is that all animals are tied together by food so this pyramid that you see here is basically it's called a it's a marine trophic pyramid which shows how food or food energy is passed from one level to another so starting from the broad base which is algae to the apex predatory animals and you have all these different groups of fishes which uh, in between uh, in these levels and uh, it so this pyramid basically tells us that each level of this pyramid is important and has an important role or a function to play in the marine system so as we are as we will uh, go to identify uh, learn how to learn basic keys on a uh, fish identification it will be also interesting to uh, learn what role they play based on their feeding habits so basically if uh, the fishes are herbivores or algae eaters or invertebrate eaters or plankton eaters or fish eaters so before we start this uh, fish identification journey uh, just guess in your mind if what i'm going to show you guys is a fish or not is this a fish how about this one and how about these guys so before we go to the answers of those questions let's first see what makes a fish a fish so fishes are basically animals that have backbone they have jaws they have scales on their bodies they have gills to breathe and they live in water but there are so many exceptions to all these characteristics basically fish are animals which have all these different characteristics like they have a backbone they have jaws they have scales and they have gills and they live under water but i was saying that there are many uh, fishes which typically don't look like a fish so what's the verdict on these fish uh, which goes to say that identifying because of the sheer diversity of fishes identifying fishes is a long process and i'm sure we'll get there so so now but there are some uh, clues which Uh, there are some resources which will definitely help us in uh, identifying different fish so there are resources in form of books uh, there are underwater slates which you can take underwater when you go for your dive uh, but and and then there are computer there are mobile applications which also help you id fish but there are some basic things that can actually help you 
uh, use these books uh, and various applications. So let's start by looking at some of the basics. So first, let's look at the different parts of a fish. Uh, now, if, now different uh, fishes they have uh, so many different differences uh, in the way they look, which is going to help you ID fish. So, for example, uh, some fishes have their mouths uh, facing upwards. Some are facing downwards. Uh, they some have like a very sloping uh, head. Some uh, have different uh, variations in all the uh, uh, in the placement and the numbers of different fins. Uh, so, uh, apart from all these uh, different things, uh, there are a few other things also that we are going to look at that's going to help you identify fishes. And the first thing is, let's say, names. So, identifying fishes comes with assigning different names. And so I'm sure you guys have heard that there's, there are uh, scientific, there's, there's a scientific process of naming different life forms. So basically there are two unique words which are mostly in Latin, which, and these words often uh, depict a distinct aspect of their bodies. So you have longirostris, which means a long rostrum. Uh, so, uh, so basically, uh, you have these different Latin names, but then for our rescue, we have something called uh, common names also, which uh, make it easier to paint a picture in your head. Like hey, a big long nose butterfly fish looks like the one with has a big nose. So uh, it's so, and also different family names also. Uh, the family is basically uh, groups of uh, life forms which share common attributes. So, for example, butterfly fishes uh, is a common family name, and they're called butterfly fishes because if you keep two butterfly fishes together, they look like a butterfly. So, this way, the common names help. Uh, they're often confusing because they are vernacular, different areas have different names for every fish. So, yes, so it's a bit risky to use. Uh, common names. So mostly in our work in ecology uh, research and everything, we mostly use scientific names. So now, uh, now we know that no body in body shape is so important to identify a fish, and each fish has a different uh, has a particular body shape, which can help you identify it, uh, like some of the general body types like if it's elongated or if it's oval or if it's disc shaped or if it's that shape also tail shape also helps you identify by looking at the tail so next uh also you have so various body markings basically if uh like for example in this fish in the yellow white fish we see that they have a chevron pattern uh or in this big fish, uh, it's almost spotted. So is there anything else apart from the way fishes look that we can use to identify different fish? So next time when you guys go for a dive, what you can do is identify how a fish moves. So, uh, so we have this really helpful uh, infographic which is made by Bardhan and his colleagues which shows how different uh, like which which fins or which parts of the body the fish is used to propel uh, in the water so that's one really interesting way to also identify fish and so there are many aspects which actually group fishes into different uh, which segregate them into different groups. So just like a very uh, brief uh, thing I'd like to talk about the different ways in which fishes uh, reproduce. Uh, so basic, it's different for different uh, species and different groups of fish. So in most cases, the female uh, fish, it drops eggs in the water, which are which are immediately fertilized by uh, sperm from the male. There's another way uh, 
for fertilization to occur is when the female body before she drops them in the water and then you have some um, cases where the female it, it it keeps the eggs within her body and then the young ones are born alive like yeah and also you have something with uh, some fishes which are hermaphrodites so they are they have males and female organs in one fish for example you have the clownfish so with all this info uh, i'm going to basically uh, share with you guys a sample of fish which you would typically see on a dive which would be striking uh, uh, when you guys see them in the water so and as i mentioned earlier fish iding is a constant process and we're going to only begin to scratch the surface of fish identification um so let's begin so first i have grouped uh, colorful fishes which are disc and oval shaped they these these fish always catch your eye because they have their vibrant colors they have different beautiful patterns and uh, they're flitting on the reef very nicely and they have most of them and they have laterally compressed bodies they have like flattened bodies so starting with butterfly fishes now uh, butterfly fishes are del delicate looking fishes and uh, the key so key feature for identifying these fish is that they have protruding mouths so you'll always see them just flitting on the reef always trying to uh, nip something on the reef uh, and they're slow moving most of the time uh, and another key to identify uh, butterfly fishes is that they are most of the time in pairs so and they and these pairs are mostly monogamous uh, that means they are couples but th there's recent research which which says that these fish not just breed together but they also help each other finding food and they also help each other defend their territory and one fun fact is that if one a uh, adult if an adult pair gets separated from um the other partner the other makes an effort to find and rejoin the partner so that's 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 butterfly fishes and then you have angel fishes now angel fishes are called angel fishes because if you can see their if you hold the fish uh, vertically their fins on the sides they look like angel wings so that's why they're called angel uh, fishes and that's common names for you guys um so basically angel fishes are like equally vibrant and colorful like butterfly fishes but then they're a bit larger in size and a quick key to identify uh, angel fishes is uh, as i mentioned that they have rear and uh, the the rear anal and dorsal fins they are extended yes and this this adaptation is basically to uh protect itself from predation or uh, because they are spiny so pointy so uh and this feature is also present in most angel fishes and not in butterfly fishes so that's one distinguishing factor also there's one uh, thing uh, if you closely look at their operculum Uh, which is the covering on their gills it has this modif it has a spine so that's one uh, key uh, distinguishing thing about uh, angel fishes there's another interesting interesting thing that i would like to add here is that um which is on another level about fish identification is a lot of fish fishes have uh when they um when they have babies their babies don't look anything like the adults so basically that's to confuse so uh, that is to that's an adaptation to escape predation they look inconspicuous on the reef and uh, so when you guys go for a dive just don't think that it's a different type of fish and um so then moving on to surgeon fishes well surgeon fishes as uh, like they've given they've been given the name surgeon 
fishes because they have uh, scalpels, which is basically a modified spine, which is at the uh, at the base of their tail, which is at the starting of their tail. Um, and they're really sharp. And that's that's a really good uh, defense weapon that they use. Uh, and uh, so, and they're also like, you'll also see them just like birds in the water. Like they're just flying, they're, they're just using their pectoral fins to move about. And uh, you'll always, you'll most of the time see them in big aggregations in groups uh, feeding on like fleshy algae. And these are one of the common fishes on the reef. And yeah, so these are uh, some more types of species of surgeon fishes. And then coming to parrot fishes. Now, um, I'm sure when you guys have gone for a dive, one of the first things that people identify is a parrot fish. So it's, it's difficult to identify individual species of parrot fish because they, they show different colors and patterns according to age and sex. But most of them are brightly colored in shades of blue, green, muddy reds. And uh, one, one, one thing that you um, can notice about these fishes is their really strong teeth. So when you guys are diving, you can also keep your ears open. And if you see some munching on the reefs, then you know that it's a parrot fish. Because what they do is they're, they're making these scrap scraping noises as they're they're chomping on algae from the dead corals. And in that process, they eat a lot of coral. And, uh, and that basically when they poop, it becomes sand. Uh, and you can identify parrotfishes based on their very distinct caudal fin, uh, which is mostly of that shape. Then there are many fishes which indicate reef health also. So a lot of these fishes like parrot fishes and surgeon fishes, they uh, feed on uh, algae, uh, which basically, uh, so they basically feed on algae, which is growing on or near corals. And this gives uh, space and there's no competition for coral. So basically it gives them scope, uh, gives coral scope to grow. So these, if you have, if you see these fishes, like parrot fishes, surgeon fishes, butterfly fishes, uh, angel fishes, and another group uh, called rasses, uh, if you see them, then they, then they are like indicators of good uh, reef health. So now that we've seen a lot of delicate, beautiful, brightly colored fishes, let's move on to heavy bodied fishes. And I'll be particularly talking about groupers. So groupers are uh, a, an important uh, group of fishes and you can, you, so they are in a, a range of sizes uh, and they're mostly like sitting, like during the daytime when you go for a dive, they're sitting just perched on the reef like that. Um, and uh, so they, you can recognize them uh, be, because of their sloping heads and they have a large mouth uh, and most of them have like rounded tails. And if you just go past them and you will just see some one uh, grouper just take shelter in a cave. That's because they, they are mostly active at night, they're nocturnal species. So, so, and there are a number of fishes which are also, uh, which also form schools. So basically, so fishes form schools basically to escape predation. So fusilias are one of those fishes uh, which you will not miss when you're on the reef. They have like really sleek streamlined bodies and as a school when they move, uh, basically they look like arrows darting. And these fish uh, basically feed on, uh, so there are tiny uh, organisms uh, suspended in the water. So they're basically planktonivores. They eat all that plankton. And uh, uh, another key to identify these species, apart from the fact that they are mostly in groups, is that they have a deep folk tail. 
Now there are some fishes which are which have unique uh, features. Like for example, I'm going to talk about goat fishes, and you guys must have guessed that why they're called goat fishes because they have these chin barbels, uh, which help, which are basically like underwater sensors. They are chemosensory, and they I, they basically help the fish find out their food, which is invertebrates, and uh, and also they have, and that's why also they have these downward facing mouths to just eat up all the food. And then you have uh, silvery fishes, which is a huge, huge group uh, of fishes, which has uh, really uh, millimeter sized fishes, which basically I study to you have really big uh, size fishes, which I'm sure if you guys have gone for a deep dive in Andamans, you'll always see them uh, over your heads, uh, which are, these are barracudas. And so basically, so these silvery uh, fishes, uh, they also form huge schools and, uh, and they're silvery, mostly silver to gray and mostly uh, patterned, uh, unpatterned, sorry. Uh, they, so they have silver skins because that makes them less visible to predators uh, and uh, because it does not uh, reflect uh, light basically. And then this, and they are basically pelagic fishes. So they spend a lot of time in the water, but they do spend some time in the, on the reefs, near the reefs also. So the fishes that I work on are planktivorous fish. That is, they eat all the plankton, which is there in the water column. But then there are also, not all silvery fishes are uh, eating, uh, eat plankton. There are some fishes which are piscivorous. So that is, they eat, Fishes. So, uh, uh, for example, this you have is a, a bluefin shovelly, and it eats. Uh, it's one of the apex uh, predators. So, uh, we saw different types of uh, groups of different fishes. But what's in what's interesting is to look at the interactions between these fishes. Uh, and when you go for a dive, you can observe how the different dynamic interactions these are. For example, you have this piscivorous uh, trivially uh, hunting for these small uh, pelagic fishes, or there's a whole bunch of things happening here. So basically, reiterating the fact that all these different groups of fishes that we saw here, they are uh, they they they're all important. They all. Uh, are part of the uh, food uh, uh, of the food web, uh, and how uh, it's important. All of these parts are important for the ecosystem. So, having said that, I would like to go to Vartan. Thank you, Prerna. Thanks a lot, and uh, it's really nice to know about different reef fish, and you cover pretty much everything. Yeah, so so okay, this is just a, a sort of summarizing everything. Uh, we will be sharing with you resource uh, material and links and website that you can use. If you have any questions, any feedback, or if you have you want to ask any particular question in terms of coral ID or fish ID, uh, feel free to uh, reach out. We'll also give you names of other friends who are very good with reef fish ID and coral ID. Um, and hopefully that will uh, help you. And uh, uh, the reason why this image was displayed as the last image of this presentation was, this is where, this is how the reef was in, in back in 2003, 2004, 2005. And what if you dive at the same place, again, the reefs look completely different. And what we want as divers and as uh, enthusiasts, we want to see this kind of reef. and. Uh, Today in, in Indian waters, it is difficult to find these kind of reefs. And I hope that uh, as collective, as a, as a uh, collective community, we are able to uh, make some change and we are able to see these kind of reefs which exist in our waters by protecting them, by giving them due protection.